and let Mary, Mary Ellen and Linda share with you how they know each other and how they've come together on this particular presentation. So I'm going to let you go from here. I don't know if you want to start, Mary Ellen. All right. <laughs> After that. And for those of you that don't know, Mary Ellen and I are mother and daughter. I'm mm -hmm. the daughter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> and so we are at Mary Ellen's house. Um, we've been pretty much um, COVIDing. We've been COVIDing, COVIDing, yeah. coronavirus, Whatever quarantining, quarantining together here. So, um, so that's why we're together, and that's why you can see Mary Ellen's house in the background rather than our <laughs> office. <laughs> so, um, we hope you're well, and we'll get started. All right. Well, thank you, Sheila, for getting us started. Um, so I've known Linda for a long time, over 20 years, and um, we kind of came together at a place called the Curtis Blake Day School on the campus of American International College in Springfield, Massachusetts, where there um, at the time was a diagnostic center on the college campus, a college level support service for students with uh, learning disabilities, and the Curtis Blake Day School, which is in operation, and it's a school for children with dyslexia and language learning disabilities. So it's been in existence for a long time. And at the time Linda came on board, I was working both at the Diagnostic Center and at the day school and teaching courses in language development at American International College uh, to people who were not speech and language pathologists but needed state certification for Massachusetts license. And anyway, we, um, Linda came on board and it was one of the best days uh, for the school at that time. And um, I was, as a speech and language pathologist, the director of the intervention curriculum there. And Linda was a speech and language pathologist. So there was great synergy and there, there still is great synergy among the speech and language pathologists and the teachers who are all reading teachers. Um, so anyway, this just shows a few of our pictures um, together, and Linda, you have some input there. Well, it was a great day to become employed at the Curtis Blake Day School and get, have the opportunity to work for Mary Ellen. As you all know, she's a brainiac and knows so much, so I learned a lot from her. Mm -hmm. And then, sadly, she left, and she opened um, her own business, My Wing Concepts, to work more on her products in detail. Um, so... But fortunately, we were able to still collaborate. And as I was first at the day school, I was responsible primarily for the upstairs program. I called them the itty bitties, and it was the students that were in grades one through five, and I developed that program. That's um, the group of students that we did the research the research um, project that we did. And um, over time, um, I spent a lot of time testifying at hearings for students and realized that I needed to again continue my education. So I obtained a license um, as a reading specialist. And um, also at the same time that I was finishing up that, I was promoted to principal of the day school. And um, so those are the, some of the slides here are well, the one where me, I'm hugging the kids, that's the last day of school. And then a couple of the pictures are, are us at the ASHA convention with the SLPs. Mm -hmm. But as Mary Ellen said, the day school has always been a collaborative effort. The teachers are um, reading specialists and all of the tech um, programs that Mary Ellen has created, all those methodologies are integrated throughout the day, and it just made it a wonderful place to work. And I just wanted to say on the lower right-hand picture, that was uh, an award uh, that I or the Story Grammar Marker received from the International Dyslexia Association, Massachusetts branch for contributions to comprehension and reading. So that's kind of in essence, uh, where we are there. And today, we're going to be presenting 11 elements of the Story Grammar Marker treatment process. Our other workshop that we had done was taking a, a student's uh, profile, looking at his narrative sample, and showing how to use it on Doc Hub and how to document what Asha was calling for in document, document, document. So this one now is how we would go about treating this person and various things that we would be doing. Linda, do you have anything? 
Cor no, correct. So we will take you through each of these um, one by one. Um, but first, we'll go back and we're going to give you some background information about the Story Grammar Marker programming and methodology. And then we're going to give you background information about the text we used. And then we will get into these specific strategies and go through them one by one. And it's important to remember that these are not presented in a linear me method where you do one, then the next, then the next. These are all done in an integrative manner all at the same time. And that's kind of the hardest part of learning how to do all of this, but we'll take you through that so you can do it the way we did it. Great. <clears throat> so before we delve into it, we want you to know a little bit more about the Story Grammar Marker. And the Story Grammar Marker, I call it an approach because it's much more than the tool. Although the tool is visual, kinesthetic, tactile, so that children with all kinds of abilities can use it. Uh, you're going to see that on it are the, what we will call the macro structure elements of an episode. And an episode is the basic unit of a plot. The plot doesn't have to be in a book. The plot can be in a video. The plot can be unfolding in life. So as we look at the story grammar marker icons, which um, this is the 29th year of the Story Grammar Marker. So it's been around a while and it has always reflected changes in the research and what we're looking at in terms of narrative development and its place in education. So there's a character, a setting is the star. We're still um, at, it's more than a time and a place though. The setting is the situation that is happening. We're going to talk more about that today. The initiating event or the kickoff is something that wasn't expected. The um, feeling, the internal response is the emotional reaction to the kickoff. The thinking bubble is the mental state reaction to the kickoff. Um, the plan is what the character decides to do. And you can see there, it's a little hand. It's kind of white on white there, but it's a hand that means stop, think, and make a plan. The beads are pulled down first, next, after that, finally, when the character is doing things to carry out the plan. Those are the attempts. At the end, there's a bow, a white bow, and it is the direct consequence. It's the tie up and it's the outcome of all those actions that were done to get from the plan. And at the end, there are three little hearts, which are called the resolution. And they mean the feeling that the character had at the end. Is he happy or not with what happened? If he's not happy, he may decide to change his plan. Or maybe he's going to decide to change one or two of the actions. We can all picture ourselves in that situation. The other meanings of the little hearts at the end would be a lesson learned. Was there a lesson learned? And the other one is, was there a moral to the story? So this diagram is in almost all of our manuals and I've used it since the beginning um, of the story grammar marker approach and process to show that what we're talking about is a tool that is built on the foundation of oral language and it develops oral language for use in the other modalities of language, like reading or listening comprehension, writing, speaking, viewing, and gesturing. So at the bottom, you're going to see at the very bottom, the child comes to us with whatever experiences and environment he or she is coming from. And there, the child is experiencing and dealing with the strands of oral language. There's a pragmatic strand, a phonological strand, the sound system, semantics, which would be vocabulary, syntax, which would be the order of sentences, or the fact that the words in the vocabulary aspect get put into sentences in some kind of a form. And then the thing that we're talking about today is the discourse level of language which sits on this chart between syntax and thought. 
And that's kind of what it does. It expresses in language what we are thinking about. So that's discourse language, and that's what the story grammar marker whole approach is about. And when I think of doing that, I think of, um, I'm trying to get it, um, taking that out. If discourse is not there, children can answer questions, maybe have a one sentence or a couple of sentences to answer a question. But unless they are assisted in their discourse development, they are a lot of times unable to organize the big picture. So today, we'll be talking about narrative discourse and also expository discourse because any good story, particularly novels, will have a mixture of both within them. And you know, it's very important that we bring children's attention to the structure of the story, but also the fact that the setting, some of the kickoffs, the consequences, the actions of a story are brought about because of an historical era that they happen to be written in. So do you have anything, Linda, that you wanted to say at this point? I think that's great. That's okay. great. Um, so I also wanted to mention that we will be talking about connecting theory to practice. And this is a chart. I'm holding it up, but the picture of the chart is there. It's a two-sided chart. And I actually developed this for Orange County in Florida of quite a few years ago, which is why there's the water analogy from shallow water to deep water. And um, so we're going to talk about today the combination of narrative development and expository text development in assisting this particular child in progress toward his oral language development. And to the right um, of your screen, it shows for those of you who have a background in the stages of narrative development, it kind of shows a rollout as to um, presenting uh, expository text. For instance, um, in the action sequence where a child is in stage two, if you look at it at the top, stage two of a narrative, where he can give you a character, a setting, and a bunch of actions that may not be in order, but may be in order, that's an early stage of narrative. But if a child is able to list and sequence those actions, then he is probably able to do a list and a sequence from information text. For instance, a list of things that you need for an art project and the sequence of the art project. So bearing in mind that it doesn't have to be all at once or it doesn't have to be just one type of information text. Sometimes it's really just procedure that people look at in terms of information text, but it can be all of these text structures at the bottom that may um, be presented over time, depending on what a child can do with the narrative. So my, um, I think this is probably the last one I was going to um, talk about here, but it's a need, there's a need to embed information text into narratives and lessons in general. Because this builds background knowledge so I just wanted to look at this quote. The more teachers bring background to a text via nonfiction readings, the more they socialize the students to copy that progress process and to do it repeatedly as they read. I, um, I was interested in looking at the setting of the novel that we're using today, Esperanza Rising. And it was mentioned in the story and a few things were mentioned about it. And I thought I should go and look into a map of Mexico and see exactly where Aguas Calientes is. And I learned a lot about it. 
So I brought that into my background knowledge and it helped me understand the reason for the way Esperanza rising is um, each chapter is the name of a crop. So nonfiction embedded into lessons and books makes it relevant and engaging. And most of all, it increases the amount of knowledge, which is huge. It's the sixth pillar of reading. It's to enable children to develop their knowledge. Um, so uh, one of the things that Linda and I looked at in preparation for this presentation was the current issue of topics and language disorders, uh, a journal that comes out four times a year. And there were, it was all devoted to um, language sample analysis. There's Linda holding it up. There it is. And we found it great. And we wanted to recommend it to you as just a, a thing in itself. But in the article by Eisenberg, there was a reference to a Macaulay and Fay um, uh, sequence of how to write a goal, like what a goal involves, what is a goal, because this is something that we'll be doing for this particular client. We'll be talking about the goals that we're using with him. So you'll see underlined in purple, the four areas, and I took it directly from, I quoted it directly from the article, and I added a little bit in my parentheses there. But the basic goal area is the first one. So say with this boy, I wanted to work on grammar, which to us is the microstructure of a story or information text. It's not the big organizational structure that the icons would refer to, but it's the sentences. So we're looking at grammar. The next would be an intermediate goal. Within grammar, what do I want to work on? Oh, he needs work on complex sentences because all he's doing is giving a phrase or some sentences connected by and. Um, so it's more than simple and compound sentences because of his age. Um, then under that and more refined, under complex sentences, what's the specific goal? And in the article, it mentioned sentence complements, which is wonderful for us because they are how, to, if you have a sentence complement, you can express perspective taking and theory of mind. And it's something that has to be developed over time using mental state and linguistic verb structures. So I have an example of it there, of this um, sentence complement. Um, this is my granddaughter, Lauren, when she was in third grade, and I was trying to engage her in talking about open responses, which she wasn't too interested in at the time. Um, so as I was mentioning to her, what is an open response anyway? Lauren is now um, entering college. But she said, I know that you know what an open response is, but I think that you want me to tell you what one is so that you can tell the teachers what a third grade girl thinks it is. I wrote that sentence down. It's probably the best example of a sentence compliment. It gives two perspectives and it signals that she knows what I'm thinking about. I know that you know what an open response is. So the part that the sentence complement is about is um, the modification of either the um, mental state verb like know or think or the word tell, which is a linguistic verb or a communication verb. So it's very important that we develop these kinds of sentences over time, but they take years, of course, with a lot of our students. And then the sub goal under that specific goal would be, well, this student doesn't even know what mental state verbs are. So I have to introduce the mental states and maybe I'm going to do that through literature. 
So this is something that you would take from the big picture and reduce it. Um, we just thought we'd put that in there because I thought it was a great way to think about the planning of goals. The outcome of this goal is uh, a better sentence. So Linda, this was our oral narrative retelling that we presented uh, the last time and we used Shipwrecked from the Merritt and Lyles 1987 study. And after the student heard the story Shipwrecked was read to the child, he did not read it, but it was read out, read to him. He had to summarize the story. And this is a typed up, the story is transcribed, it's recorded, and then we type it up. And then we go back and look at it and we identify the macro structure elements. So you can see that um, the icons for character and setting and the initiating event are added to it. And then we also look at the little story details, whether there are, is cohesion, those are circled. We um, have a process for under, double underlining adverbs. If he had had any linguistic verbs, they would have been underlined with one line. And if he had used any parts, uh, mental state verbs, a critical thinking triangle, a little triangle would have been put above them. And if there's any noun phrases, we put those on quotation marks. So after we have taken a narrative and transcribed it in this manner, we're able to then transpose it um, onto Mary Ellen's forms that she has in the data collection manual. And that allows you to be able to identify the narrative structure, the macro, the micro, and then um, de determine what the goals will be. So we will continue with that. So if you go back to the previous, um, this is fine. Yep, nope, you're right, Sheila. Okay. If you go back to the previous, I was anticipating that this was coming. If you go back to the previous presentation that we did, I took the forms to analyze the macrostructure and the microstructure, and I place them into a program called DocHub, and that's an online PDF annotator that you can create templates, and you can add text to them, put shapes on them, and then ultimately update the content. Mm -hmm. So I went in there and put four of her um, pro, uh, forms in there, and Eval, uh, um, analyzed the uh, student's narrative and it you know it says some additional information you can use it with drop dot uh, dropbox google drive gmail and um it just looks great when you use this to for these forms to document um that information and i see somebody said can you share those templates and i those are available um um they were put together as a package um on the website and it was a, um, I think it was $15. Is it, I don't know if it's still there, Sheila, but you can purchase them. Yes, it is still there on the website. Um, I can show you at the end where yeah. those are. Sorry, our house phone is ringing <laughs> um, in the background. Um, I can show you where those are at the end. Um, it was a, there was a very, I think a 33 page downloadable packet. Mm -hmm. I wanna say almost, I, I, mo probably almost everybody from the last session um, had purchased it. $14.95 and you got all of these that Linda made um, were in there as well. So it was it, in addition to a bunch of other things. So um, it's pretty fantastic. So I can show that at the end. Yes. Linda, if you just want to raise your finger to let me know, I'm controlling the slides today. Okay. Oh, good. So, all right. just, so we can that so when you I want it. it. Well, I think at this point, I, I think the next, I think I'm going, supposed to go into Doc Hub. Mm -hmm. so, what is the next slide? I forgot what it is. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to go into Doc Hub right now. But the forms that I put into Doc Hub are the progress monitoring forms. So number one is the um, macro, and number two, I think, is the micro. And then there's a narrative macro graph, and then there's literate language features. So those are the four templates that are in Doc Hub that you can use to put data in and to update them. And then today, we're so today, what we're going to do is we're going to review these documents. I'm going to go into Doc Hub and pull them all up for you to see. And then I'm going to, um, we're going to talk uh, using the narrative decision tree. Um, we're going to determine what level the student is at because we never got to that the last time we ran out of time. And then we're going to go back and identify some goals for them. So at this point, Sheila, I think I go to share screen, correct? Yes. Yeah, so mm -hmm. Mary Ellen will stop yeah. sharing. Oh, okay. She does that first. Yeah. All right. I'm going to go to share screen. And let's see now, how do I get to my main thing sheila let's see I if don't... you if you exit full screen up on your right yep there you go yeah so now i'm seeing so you have to open 
Doc Hub, I did have it opened. Okay, so it should show up on your as options. It's hiding behind. It's hiding behind this. So maybe close that. This little thing when it drops. Yeah. Down. It says to stop share though. Um, uh, probably maybe stop stop sharing while you're switching, and, and then you can start. Happens. You'll start. You can start sharing again. So. If I reduce this, should I reduce everything? Um, Here's my dashboard is right here. No, it's okay. So now how do I get back to, do I go to webinar? Yeah. Let's see. I'm not sure how I share with you again. Um, you, you don't see my... If you, if you swipe, if you go down to the bottom or up, up to the top where the panel is, the menu, um, you should see an option for share screen again. Yeah, and I'm not seeing that. Isn't that funny? Um, I see, if you, what I do see you that. see? What do you see right now? I just see Zoom, and then I have webinar registration. Okay, so go go to the bottom, and you might you might see a little. Um, it looks like, like webinar in process. Yeah, it looks like the Zoom symbol at the bottom. If if you click on it, it should pop back up. Join meeting. Um, there's one that says, sorry about this people. Yes, Zoom. that's okay. We'll, we'll get there. Um, I'm going to say yes. I'm just going to, oh, shoot. We lost our, okay. Let me, let me get her back. Okay. All right. Don't rejoin. You'll be in it two times. Um, hold on. Let me see. This is a kickoff we well, haven't had. I know, and it's funny because the last time I had no problem and we've been practicing this. Yes. That's just that. Okay, so maybe X out of that. X out of the... Um, Do you see this? We, we see the, the language sample analysis. Keep so you point. don't see the... No, it says my screen sharing is paused. Just a second. So how do I get resume share? Yeah. Okay. Now if you if you X out of the please move this window away from the shared application. Um, you know what? Stop sharing. And then can you can you see anything in the background? Um, dashboard, do you see this? No, we don't see that. Um, but but now that you've got the dashboard up, does it give you an option to click on Doc Hub? I'm in Doc Hub. I'm in the dashboard Doc Hub. Okay, is what I so see. Go go to share screen again. And that I don't have. It should be if you go um, to the bottom. Wait a minute. I think. Sometimes the menu disappears. Okay, there you, you go. You got it. You got it. Uh, sorry, folks. Oh my goodness gracious. <laughs> no, and well, and uh, everyone, I everyone's been writing, Linda, that they understand because everyone, <laughs> let's, let's be honest, everyone's been using video conference it's a, it's, it's, so everyone it's a, feels our pain. <laughs> oh my gosh. So it's a good thing that um all right. So I'll st yes. it's terrible. It's a good thing it's a cool day in New England. I'd be sweating, sweating bullets here. So, anyways, when you come into a uh, doc hub, you have a dashboard. And as you see, there's um, several things over here on the left hand side. And as I look at my dashboard, I'm going to page number two because I know that I'm right now I'm looking for the progress monitor narrative macro structure on the sample student. So I'm opening up this um, uh, PDF. And so I took all the information from the student from the narrative and I have recorded it on this progress monitor. So you can see I called him, uh, I put sample student up here and I put the name of the story here and I said it was an informal oral narrative retelling and you would put SLP in there. So all these boxes are things that you can type into because I have made a template out of this. And this is what was in the that 1495 um, item. So based on what the student did, I've scored everything. So he did not um, name the character. He used a pronoun. He did state um, uh, the place of where it was, but not the time. And then he had three or more temporally sequenced actions. He stated the kickoff, 
in the sentence form and he related to the character and the setting. He did not state the character's uh, internal response to their initiating event, which was being shipwrecked at sea. He did not talk about any mental state verbs were not used to talk about the character's thoughts. He inferred the plan. He um, used two elements of the critical thinking triangle, the initiating event and an inferred plan. So he received a score of two. He had some planned attempts. He had the direct consequence and he did state the feeling related at the end. This number 16 here represents the total of all the numbers that were circled. And this was taken in April of 2020. After the narrative is read to the student and they retell it and you, um, you then ask them to answer some questions. And this narrative, as well as all the questions and all their answers were in that 1495 packet. So you could administer this as well. And it was, um, the data collected on it was normed on uh, students in the sixth grade. And it's anticipated that um, in the sixth grade that you would be able to answer 75% of the factual as well as 75% of the inferential questions. So you can see down here, I have 63 slash 81. And with a language impaired student, I um, typically um, ask them to um, answer the questions and see what their response is. And if I feel that their language disability is interfering with their response, I kind of go fishing and I say, tell me more, can you tell me more? So when we went fishing, he was ultimately able to increase his ability to answer the inferential questions to 81% which is great. And then his inferential questions were 69%. And that's close, close, but not quite there at the 75. And this student was in the eighth grade um, at this time. So that's the first form that we use. And I explained, there's an extensive list of directions on how to use Doc Hub that were based on a Jennifer Metz, a teacher at the school had written them up for the students. And I modified that a bit. So there's an extensive set of directions how to do that. I'm going to leave by putting my um, cursor uh, checking on the big D and it says there's unsaved changes. Are you sure you'd like to continue? And yes, you don't want to save these changes because you want to go back in and update that form. And if you save it, then it's like concrete. So then taking that information from that first form, you can go into the narrative macro structure graph. So this is another form that, that was also included in the packet. So all those numbers that Mary Ellen, on her Mary Ellen's form, they've all been now plotted in a graph-like form. And I love this form for parents because I feel so many of them relate more to a visual form than looking at a lot of language. And what's wonderful about this form is you can score them and using uh, up here, there's a thing called a stamp and you choose a stamp and you place it where it is. I don't want to place any stamps there, but these circles represent the pretest. And then you would take an additional narrative of him and you would then put the square stamp in there. And our hope would be that after we've identified the yearly goal and his short-term objectives and we worked for him a while, when we take um, his next narrative, we're going to see an increase there. We're gonna leave this form, form for a moment because I wanna show you the other ones and then we're coming back to this to talk about um, goals and objectives. So I do wanna leave it. Is this going okay? If you can give, are, are you getting feedback, Sheila, that people are following this? Yeah. Am I going too fast? Yeah, well, people are following it and people, people um, actually, uh, hold on, let me just say one thing. In, in sure. A second. So um, many people have asked for the link to the Zoom in on documentation packet that Linda and Mary Ellen are referring to. And I put the link in the chat, but just know that at the end of this, you'll get a link to all of the materials that we refer to during the webinar, along with a 25% off uh, discount code. So uh, believe me, I, we've got you covered with that part. <laughs> That's right. In these COVID times, um, <laughs> we, we have all that available and it will be in your handout. So I'll definitely have that for you. Okay, so just wanna make sure that you don't, um, yeah like get worried about it. Okay. And well, Linda, if you can't, you, if you can't, oh, go ahead, Mary Ellen. No, I was, I was not going to say anything about that. I was just <laughs> going to say about the, um, the one to four here under each area that you Yes. Know, those are increment, increments for therapy. So this form is not only, um, a, um, like a way to document progress, but it's a planner as well. Correct. In your next steps. That's and right. So anyone who wants to know. That's right. Yeah. 
And our goal, again, if the same thing would be here, we would, if he's starting out of the three, we'd hope that ultimately by working with us in our intervention, he would move up, the numbers would move up. But uh, as happens often with these kids, certain things move and other things are, get nowhere. And mm -hmm. what I loved about this form when Mary Ellen developed is that, is what I just said, these children move so slowly, they often don't move up a macro structure level. They make these small changes within a level. And by using this format, you can show that slow and steady progress they're making to document what you're doing um, in treatment. I think it's wonderful. So once again, taking the student's narrative, we went in and scored what he did in terms of microstructure, not the macrostructure, not, not the big pieces. You, but some, uh, there were a few people that, that uh, had questions and comments. I just want to oh, sure. really quick with this is that um, pe people who bought um, this a long time, bought data collection a long time ago, um, might not have had the mental states. Is that possible? Correct. Oh, That's yes. correct. So, yeah, so this is, this, been this is the new form. Or the microstructure. Or the microstructure. Uh, Correct. One either. Right. And those are in this 14. Uh, da, um, Correct. This da, and also a couple of people did ask, um, again, not to interrupt now, but I just feel like you might want to just say it again. Um, Doc Hub is a website, so you just can sign up for it. It's free unless you want the special perks, but um, DocHub.com. Um, right. It is the so just so you know, it's not something mindwing sells. It's something that that Linda has discovered very very helpful with being able to use mindwings progress monitoring forms in a very easy, um, shareable way. And so that's um, we we went over how. In fact, the the Zoom into documentation packet we keep talking about has step by step by step by step like the most detailed directions on how to use this piece of yeah. technology. I don't even yeah. know how Linda did it, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I used Je Jennifer Metz help, but remember we were designing this to, for language impaired kids to be able to understand what to do too. And as you can see, we have such attention to detail. I would want to be able to know how to do it well. So I always appreciate when information is really detailed. That's why I love these forms of Mary Ellen's because they're so detailed and it enables me to be a better um, clinician. So again, we, um, as we were saying, we, I took the um, information from his narrative and looked at the microstructure, how he's kind of gluing everything together. So he did have some compound sentences. His pronouns um, were des designating the main character. Um, he did have a an adverb um, clause. He, in terms of the uh, additional literate language features, he had um, a noun modifiers. He, in terms of his conjunctions, he used both additive and temporal. So that's why I have two numbers circled there. In terms of adverbs, he had an adverb of degree. He had no mental state verbs, no linguistic verbs. And again, he received a score of 14. So you would readminister that and you would come up with a new score and place it in this box here to do that. So additionally, with the literate, with this progress monitor of the microstructure, uh, Mary Ellen has another form that I've got to go to my second page to. Oh, I wanted to say about DACA, but $60 a year if you want to pay for it and, and you're allowed to do unlimited templates per day and send unlimited emails. On the free version, you can send four emails, you can share four um, forms per day and you're allowed to work, uh, create 10 documents per day. So it's very usable to do it free. I did it free for the longest time. So now I want to go to the literate language features and here we go. And there's an ex a orange exclamation point next to all of my stuff because um, it's telling me that I never finalized it. So I don't, you're, I'm wondering, are you hearing that traffic? I have my windows open. I don't know if you can hear the traffic going by, okay. No. So the literate language features um, chart, um, again, I love because it's so visual for a parent. So taking the information that I documented on the progress monitor for microstructure, I have charted all this information here. So you see, in the first column, the student used the word and four times. He used and then seven times. And in the box down here for total, two means he used two different types of additive cohesion for a total of 11 occurrences. He used two different types of sequential co cohesion for a total of three. He had no coordinating and no causal cohesion. In terms of connecting elements together, the macro structure using cohesive ties, 
he had two different types. He used a total of four times. He connected the setting to the initiating event and he connected attempts to attempts. This column for elaborated noun phrases, he used seven um, different noun phrases for a total of nine times. He did not have any um, complex ones where there would be a noun plus two adjectives in this column here. Over here, he used a few adverbs and you can see again, there's no mental state and there's no linguistic verbs, just as we documented on the other form. And then you can use this form again, you would hopefully after intervention, you would then document the second time you take the narrative and our goal would be that columns would be higher. With the exception of this area, we kind of would like to get away from that just additive cohesion and we would like to have him move down here and be using more coordinating and causal cohesion since he is in the eighth grade. So those are those four, the four forms. So if we take this information and we leave out of here and I want to go to another form that Mary Ellen has, let's see, the narrative decision tree. And I love this form because it really clearly lays out and it just shows again how Mary Ellen is so smart and all this information is taken and you ask yourself a question. Did this episode have a temporally related series of events? Yes, he did. Does the episode have a causally related sequence of actions? So what do you folks think? Did he have a causally related sequence of actions? You can throw that into the chat box. I don't think I can read it, but Sheila can. Mm -hmm. Did he have a causally related sequence of actions? So like with the, the cause, we'd be looking for kickoffs. Correct. Did he include a kickoff in this, his narrative? Um, no one has answered yet. No. Yes, yes. No. If we go back to look at. Some people say yes, some people say no. All right, so the causally related sequence of events would mean, did he have an initiating event? Did he include a kickoff in this story? And um, I could stop screen sharing and then go back into it, but that might be a nightmare for you people. <laughs> With the way. You can go back to it after. <clears throat> yes, but anyways, he did state the kickoff. He did have the, the kickoff in this his narrative. He did state the problem that the anchor broke and um, in this incident and they, they were lost at sea. So he does have an episode, um, goal directed. He did have that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the next question is, does the episode have evidence of goal-directed behavior? And remember when we were talking, I talked about his, he did not talk about feelings and he did not have a definitive plan. He kind of inferred that. So the answer here would be no, that he did not have that. So now we're going to look at reaction sequence and let's look at these four bullets here and see, answer whether he has these. There is an event that launched an action or a series of an actions. Yes, he did have an event that launched an action because he included the initiating event. Causal cohesive ties. Did he use the word so, but, or or? And if you recall, when I was looking at the literate language features chart, he used and, then, and and, and he had a couple temporal, but he did not have any causal um, cohesive ties. <laughs> did he have the intent? Feeling is not explicitly expressed. That's true. And the results of the actions is merely another action. That was pretty much how he told that. So he's received credit for three out of these four items here. So he cannot get credit for being at a reaction sequence, but he can get credit, we would say he would be at an emergent reaction sequence because he has the macrostructure, but he did not include the microstructure. He did not have those causal cohesive ties. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, did that make sense as I went through this chart with you right now? Thumbs up, thumbs down, or however you'd like to say. Yes. Yes. All right. So I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to go back out of here and I want to go back to the um, macro graph, which I think is on page two. And I don't know how I'm doing for time. Wow. I'm going to, have to talk like a speedy Gonzalez. Yeah. The, narr <laughs> the narrative macro structure. That's the microstructure graph. Oh, here we are. So if we go back here, and then what I love about this form is you have a yearly goal and then you have these short-term objectives. Mm -hmm. So if we think about the slide that Mary Ellen did where there was the four steps to writing a goal, what do we think we'd want to do for him for a yearly goal and what would we want to do for short-term objectives? 
and we know that he's down here at that uh, reactive sequence level, we would ex hope that he would be higher. So when you're thinking about goals and objectives, you have to think about the age of the student. Mm -hmm. While it might be nice to say we want to get him to use that causal cohesion, just the words but or so, he's an eighth grader. If he was a third grader or a fourth grader, I'd say, yeah, that sounds a reasonable thing. But because he's older, I believe that we need to aim higher with him to really prepare him for the literacy task that he's going to have to do in high school. So what do we think? You can type that into the chat box about what you think a yearly goal would be and or what you think a short-term objective would be. And we'll yak about that. Critical thinking, triangle, thoughts and feelings. Mm -hmm. Great. Those are great. And I love the way, Linda, how you showed the flexibility of this, because if he was in third grade, you do one thing. If he's in eighth grade, obviously you have to do something else. Correct, correct. So I think that makes sense. So for a yearly goal, we could, we could talk about what Mary Ellen said, that his yearly goal could be, we could say that it's focusing on grammar. I like if it's a little bit more specific and talks about the complex sentences. I think that that would be, I think that that enables parents and um, team members to understand what we're all trying to do. So if we're trying to get complex sentences, the other members of the team who are working on writing and reading comprehension with him, and even in his class where he might be working on spelling and composing sentences would really understand that that was the goal. And then in terms of short-term objectives, he did not have any, if we remember the literate um, language features chart, he did not have the elements of the critical thinking triangle. So um, that, that would be certainly one, one thing where you would want to start getting the elements of feeling and the, uh, the macro structure of elements of feeling and plan. And for short term objectives, we would want him to start using mental state verbs. He could be using linguistic verbs and he could also be using causal cohesion instead mm -hmm. of just stopping at the but. We're going to go for the gold and we're going to go for the word because. Um, so those things would be just typed right in here on this form. You would just add those, the various things, and then you would save it. And then the advantage of the stock hub is that you can just print that out and you have a documentation of this current time. And then when you would do your second um, testing of him and redocument it, you could discuss as a team whether he met those goals. So I'm going to just go back. And a couple of and people also said um, another goal would be using cohesive ties to um, within the how and why questions of the critical thinking triangle. And then somebody else said um, using subordinating conjunctions for meaning and sentence structure. Yeah, those are great. Yeah, that's great. And so now using this critical thinking triangle, um, that kind of somebody talked about that. And so I had this prepared because I believe that he needs to get hammered over the head with this. And this would make him, in, this tool and this methodology would allow him to see that he needs to start including feelings and plans. It has the cohesive tie words right on here as well as the mental state verbs. So every time he's reading or a narrative or when, whenever he's thinking about anything about what characters or what's going on, um, even in something that's happening in a social mm -hmm. studies text, this would be in front of him to encourage him to start using this, the cohesive ties here, these mental state verbs, as well as the macro structure. I think he should be seeing this at all times. And when you think about it, Linda, without this critical thinking triangle, all you have is a character setting and a bunch of actions and an ending. So this is the why that we want to get at. That's right. And this is the main idea. This is the main idea of everything. I mean, throughout life, we do something because we have a feeling about it because of that kickoff. If we don't have a feeling about it, we're not going to be thinking of a plan that we have to handle. If something does not give us some mental state verbs, if, if these things don't pop into our head, we're not really going to progress to this other part here. And um, he's just getting in, really still stuck in that land of action reaction. He's not really getting into the mind of the characters that he's hearing about um, as demonstrated by the narrative that he's producing. Okay. All right, so now I'm gonna get out of here and I think we go back to the, um, I stop my share and we're going back to the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Yep. I hope this makes sense to everybody. Yes. I think it really did. Okay. Email. You can let us know. Oh, yeah. Ask some questions. Because I have to now really talk at warp speed. Yes, we're gonna. <laughs> and you know, um, we. I just want to let everyone remind everyone that we 
Um, we are recording this. Um, and um, so if you have to hop off, um, I'm going to be putting in the chat the link to the, the um, handouts and the slides and all that kind of thing um, so that you have access to the discount code and um, all the information that everyone else would get just you wouldn't have access to winning a prize but we are going to go over because of those technical difficulties in the beginning and sorry about that um but uh but it's obviously awesome information so if you can stick with us that would be great yeah. and then your 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 ceu thing can be longer can be yes increase right. the time yeah. so uh, uh, can you hear me now as mary ellen and uh, sheila were just saying we decided to use the text esperanza rising for intervention for this student and um you can find this text the entire book is online on this link and we I, we can't include this in it because it says you have to be careful if you include this link and we know all copyright laws but if you go some do some channel surfing you will find the whole text from um esperanza uh, rising so next slide i think yeah so the first thing and, and as you notice up here and the, there's an icon in the corner that says elements so every time you see the little bead element that is to tell us that um, these are one of the 11 elements. So the first thing that's very important to do when you're working with a student is to build background knowledge. These kids have such difficulty understanding anything we read because they don't have background knowledge. And as Mary Ellen said, she researched about Esperanza Rising and that setting. And when I'm listening to podcasts on my iPhone, I research information. If I, I like to listen to true ones and I'm always going online to research information because then I have something to hang this additional information on I and mean, our students are just not good about doing that so ne the next slide so um, the first thing we wanted to talk about with the student would be to let them know where this story takes place so this story takes place in Aguas Cal Aguas Calientes, Mexico. So the first thing I would do with students is I would show them exactly where that is so that they understand the setting. And so that's the place um, we would could investigate through pictures what that looks like, as Marilyn said. And the story took place um, in 1930. And when I went into it now, it's very famous for its wineries. And Which we would love. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, so anyway, that's uh, kind of realistic as to the setting here with the uh, first chapter in the book being the grapes. Yeah. So the next slide. Um, yeah. Sorry. So another thing that I always did with students when I was trying to teach them uh, before I would be reading a text with them is to really go online and see what was available um, to that. Is there any way for me to control this or just Mary Ellen can, Sheila? Yeah, no, you can control you can. it. Let me... Let me give oh, you um, and I because uh, my cursor is moving. So can I if I yep. click on this? Wait, I'll uh, give. Hold on, I'm going to give you cursor control. Okay, because that way I won't have to keep saying that. Yeah, there we go. So these are I went and did some research, and these are the ver various things that are online. So at the Engage New York mod module one, there is a PowerPoint that you can find about Esperanza Rising. Um, I would typically go into something like this. Is it going to load? I don't know. Let's see. <laughs> I don't know. I don't if know if it will. Uh, I guess it doesn't want to load here, which which is probably fine because we we oh, are, we're wait, running out of time. It. Yeah, it doesn't want to doesn't really want to load. Let's see. I'll try it one more time. Yeah, but that's fine. Um, I these think... are these are all links to various. Um, um, somebody said control click, but I'm not sure what that oh. is. Now it's showing. Can everyone else see it? Oh, they're seeing the video? I Well, I can see it. Cool, because I don't see anything. I hear it. No, I, I can't. No, nobody can see it. Yeah. So nobody can fine. see it. I'm not quite sure how to stop it now either. But Hold on a second. I can hear it. No, okay. Well, the live and learn thing. Just get out of that. But that's fine. Okay. The links are the links are here. So you, I did all this research for you, so you can just go in there and look at these. I would watch them with the student. You would click on the closed captioning because the words can be printed around the along the bottom. You can stop it. You can discuss each slide. I think it's so important to make sure that you spend the time um, doing this with the students, and then to model it with them so that they right. can ultimately take that concept. Right. Right. And now, um, how do I advance it to the next screen, Sheila? Because I hit the down arrow. If you click back on your um, 
Let's see. Uh, wait a minute. Yeah, you should still have control. Oh, just click right into it. Okay, yep. super. So now the next thing is that I also did is um, I got you some links for Mexican Revolution images and 42 unforgettable images of the Mexican Revolution because Esperanza Rising, this story comes out of the aftermath of the Mexican um, Revolution. And I can hear it, but when you click on, yeah, so you, anyways, you'll be all set listening to it. So these images, some of them are graphic. He was in eighth grade. He can handle them. You would have to just go through this and decide what you want to do. You could do a pic collage, however, however you would um, like to do that. Linda, before, yeah. before we go on, there, there is a question just, um, which I think probably a lot of people have, um, a problem that, that, they, that this person wrote um, facing every day is collecting progress on objectives each and every session because they only have a half hour. So trying to provide information and then giving them opportunities to listen and build background, that's a challenge. And so it is, it very much is. And um, I, I totally understand. I had done a unit on the, on um, letting Swift River go. And I remember spending a lot of time on building that background knowledge. So what I did for collecting data was at the end of the session, um, so that I would know, I did a lot of know, want to know what I learned of the information. So I was keeping track of their comprehension and their background knowledge. That's what I did to document that and make them be responsible. I put the sticky note right on the desk as I was doing the uh, language and literature lesson. And that's how I documented um, what they were getting out of it. And I could tell who was be able to follow along and who was not. Um, so, yep. And like somebody said, exit slips, the same thing. That's to me the know, want to know. And that, that's how I was using that. Yep. And um, class-based reading, most teachers do background and you can, yep, exactly. So it depends how you want to go about doing this. I'm just showing you from soup to nuts what you would do. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of vocabulary that's related to the Mexican Revolution. So this was just, these were words that I identified at three tiers. We're going to talk about this a little bit more, but these were words that I thought were important, words and concepts I thought were important for the children to understand as they're um, going through this unit. I'm, I'm not going to go over them right now, but those are just words I identified. Based on watching the movies, looking at the videos, discussing the vocabulary, this is a um, summary using the cause effect map from uh, Mary Ellen to document the information. So I, my test question was to the students, and this again is another element of, of, that we're presenting today, list the cause of the Mexican Revolution. So I tried to narrow it down to, to not be an ex exhaustive list, but there was disagreement over the Diaz dictatorship. There was disparity between landowners and the peasants. There was no power to choose public officials or own land. And finally, the land and the resources of Mexico had been sold to foreign investors. And as a result, political parties formed that believed Diaz should not seek reelection. The peasants began an uprising in 1910 and the conflicts lasted in Mexico for over a decade. So it's important to take the information that you have learned from these two, from all the various resources to build this background knowledge and then summarize it on a text structure map so they understand where you're coming from. And Linda, I had one, one comment about the sure. text structure maps. Often uh, students are asked to make up their own graphic organizers especially when they get to be in eighth grade. But until you do this type of thing with these maps, it's almost impossible for those students to make up their own. Correct. So I just wanted to talk about that as much right. better for them to use one of the maps that goes along with the concept. Right. Okay. And the beads are just there because I wanted to show that you're, um, how you are just listing each of those causes and listing each of those effects. Mm -hmm. All righty, O'Reilly. Um, a second, another element that we wanted to discuss today was building background knowledge. So using the information from Beck building robust um, vocabulary, she came up with the concept of the tiers. I, this is probably familiar to most of, most of you. I just included this here as a review that there's tier one, those are the everyday basic vocabulary words. Tier two are more sophisticated and these really are used across domains. And then tier three words are rare words and words that apply just to a specific domain a specific um, um, area in science or social studies typically. So tier two words are really in written text. They're not so common in everyday conversa conversation. You learn them mainly from interacting with books and you're less likely to learn these words on your own. You really have to have con uh, work with a teacher typically to understand them. So again, from Beck's book, I'm just gonna 
go quickly here. She always wants you to use the context in which the word was first presented. She wants you to provide a friendly explanation um, to in a, com at a complete sentence that in, um, to help them because typically definitions are uh, one or two words and then they don't know one or two of those words so they have to look up that word in that definition they look that word up and they come back and ultimately end, they end up back at the first word they were looking up it's just this whole circle so the sentence friendly definition works much better for our students so one of the biggest resources that i love for finding friendly uh, explanation definitions is use, is using the collins dictionary and you have a link in the the powerpoint to the collins dictionary and if I click, I'm not going to click on it for time constraints today, but if you click down the Collins Dictionary, and then it will ask you to type in a word. So I typed in the word capricious. That was one of those ones that I had identified um, in the chapter. And um, what comes up is you have um, how often the word is frequently used. You can see it's just two circles. It is an adjective. You can click on this link and hear it pronounced. And then it has the word used in a sentence to allow the student to understand it. Someone who is capricious often changes their mind unexpectedly. And then they have another example of the word in a different sentence. So this is what we used for definitions at the day school for our students. And I think it's just uh, gives you a lot more bang um, for your buck. And it's free, it's online. You can type everything in there. I love it, it's great. Alrighty, O'Reilly. Um, continuing on, after providing a friendly definition, she wants you to use an additional context for the word. That additional context is in that on that Collins page. You can use that. And then you want to provide opportunities to actively process the words, making connections. So typically, I like to use the words from the vocab chart and make them use two of them in a context in the same sentence. So they start making con connections between those words. And then she wants you to focus on the few words that you've chosen on a five-day cycle um, because in each context creates a new way to get to that word and the students can bring to mind an understanding of the word more readily their comprehension will go much smoother for them and as we all know it takes so many repetitions to be able to teach words so a five-day cycle might not be realistic but working with a classroom teacher you can identify what you think would be the, the best words um, i know i'm talking like a mad fool here but we've got a lot to do the next element is building a growth mindset. These kids that we work with often really, unfortunately, have a fixed mindset. School has not been fun. It's been a challenge to do everything. And they don't see themselves as somebody who can really improve without this all this constant adult intervention. They develop a lot of learned helplessness. In a fixed mindset, you're really saying failure is the limit of my abilities. I can't go I'm either good at something or I'm not good about it. My abilities can't change. I don't like to be challenged. When I get frustrated, I give up. That's kind of what's running the tape recorder that's running through their mind all the time. We want to develop in these children a growth mindset um, to look at failure as an opportunity to learn something. You're going to move forward, that you're not bothered by challenges. They help me grow. I can learn to do anything I want to do, to, to have this um, mindset of like, I can do this. Um, I said to Marilyn, I think these poor kids, their amygdala, that flight or um, what is it, fight, fight or flight is like really big in their brain. And rather than, you know, try to figure something out, as soon as they see a literacy task, they just have this severe anxiety. I can't handle this. And they shut down before you ever uh, begin. So, yes, this is a beautiful visual that um, Sheila found for us. So I love this. Mm -hmm. And um, we have some text, some pictures here. And um, these are some books that help you teach the growth mindset. They're designed for children. A growth mindset is when students understand that their abilities can be developed. Um, if that's one of the only things that we teach these kids that we work with, we would just have done um, such a great job with them. And one of my favorite ones is the, your fantastic elastic brain. It really talks about the frontal lobes, the amygdala. And as the principal of the school, they made fun of me all the time because when something went wrong, I'd, I'd be like, dear, you didn't use your frontal lobes. How would, if using your frontal lobes, would you handle this? And so this book is just beautiful, pointing out the frontal lobes. And um, yes. I love them all. And, and I love this. Go ahead, Mary Ellen. Is your amygdala. Yep, the amygdala is the right feelings, in there. <laughs> the feelings that are related to it. Yeah. Um, you know, it, um, so anyway, it's, it's a great one because it's, of course, it's got two or three words. Um, you know, are you and your, you can make your brain do even more. So this is a great one that I've found and used. This also is one I can't do that yet. Love it. 
and it's a girl imagining she is having a conversation with somebody who's much older than she is. Turns out that she is that girl when she grows up. And so it's kind of fun to discuss. Even my, uh, my going into third grade granddaughter, Samantha, liked it, to think yes. about it that way. And then I can do hard things. Mindful affirmations for kids, but it talks about the growth mindset. And so does Esperanza Rising, in a yeah. way. Uh, the last, yes. the yeah. last they, book, thanks for the feedback. I right. yeah. yeah, and they are good for elementary kids. Yes, yes. Yeah, so these are lovely. So you you they would enjoy them, and and the fantastic elastic brain is great for the older kids um, as well. But all of them are good for them. They need to understand. They need to understand about their brain is elastic, and they can learn. And yep, they're good for middle school kids, particularly the fantastic elastic brain because it introduces all the parts of the brain. I love that. Um, in conjunction with the um, growth mindset. I believe the gradual release of responsibility, the two things go hand in hand. So this is an additional element I wanted to share. These um, slides have are from the book Reading Essentials and um, by Routman. And she has these four, she had developed these four, um, the following four slides for writing. And the gradual release of responsibility, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but what we did at the day school is we took each of these levels and we put them on a separate um, uh, eight by 11 piece of paper and I laminated them. And when I would go in to do a lesson, I would have the four of them. So the first one is an I do, and that's where the teacher is modeling and demonstrating how to do something. And that's it's true. so important that you spend a gazillion amount of times and repetitions doing this I do. People go too quickly into having students do something after too cursory of an introduction. If we think we need to spend 25 lessons teaching a vocabulary word, believe me, you're going to need to spend more time than that if you want them to improve at the sentence and at the discourse level. So the I do is the first level of gradual release of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And then the second level is the we do. And a we do is where we're doing it together. So you're doing it in addition with the student. You can see from the picture there, the student and the teacher are working hand in hand. Mm -hmm. So the teacher may still be demonstrating, but now the student is participating a little bit more and is doing, is, you know, involved in that lesson in the we do. The next level of the gradual release would be the you do, you all do. And um, Edwin Ellen calls this the y'all do lesson because he's in the South, which I like as well. And in this case, this is where there's independent practice, where the student is working on their own to do it. At the day school, I modified this and I called this the y'all do stage. And they did, at this stage, they worked with a partner because I felt for many of the students, going from a we do to a y'all do um, was a bit much for them. So it, it made them a comforting to know that they could do, they could work whatever they were doing with a partner, whatever the assignment was. And then the last um, stage of gradual release is the you do. And this is where the student is really doing independently and applying it to a new task. The way I handled this at the day school is I had these four um, charts out all the time when I was doing something. And I might come in and say, today it's an I do. And I would just put the I do eight by 11 sheet on the board. So they knew that their job that day was to listen as I did that. And after doing several I do's, I might come in and say, well, today I'm gonna to be doing a we do. So we're gonna do this task together. We're gonna to work hand in hand. And then after I did several we do's, the next time I'd come in, I'd say, okay, today you're making a decision because I wanted to develop a growth mindset in them that they could learn to do something different. And you can't have a growth mindset that you're gonna improve if you, somebody's always telling you what you're going to be doing. So I would say to them, today you're gonna to decide, are you going to be at the we do table up here with me and we're gonna do this together? Or do you think you're ready for a y'all do where you're gonna work with a partner? Or do you think you're capable of doing a you do independently? And they would identify where they were at. And if, and I would segue and work with each of the groups. And you could be in a y'all do group and you could say, you know, this is too hard for me today. I'm not getting this. And I say, well, you come join the, you, the we do group. And if somebody felt, you know, I can really do this by myself. Well, you don't need to do a y'all do. You can do a you do. So this enables them to kind of put this growth mindset and the gradual release responsibility together. So I hope that makes sense on how I was explaining that. Um, moving on to another element is the key content vocabulary. So taking the first trap chapter, I read the words that were in there. And I put some of their tier one, tier two, and tier three. And I want to explain that the tier one words really could be also under tier three. It depends where you live 
in the world and what your experiences are. So uh, um, a side, a rancho, vaqueros, campesinos, arbors, porcelain dung, bandits, they might be, f be familiar to the students you're working with. Those might be words that they hear, so they're a tier one. In New England, those tier one words really would be a tier three because our kids would not be familiar with any, with any of these words. They might be familiar with doll, but they might not be familiar with a porcelain doll is, that's with a breakable head or arms and legs. So you have to determine your tier one, whether they're really tier ones or tier three depends on where you are. But the tier two words here do apply across domains. These are words that I identified in the chapter that would be worked on. But I would not work on all of these. You have to pick and choose what you want. So of that, that tier two word list, I would work on reaping, anticipated, congregate, and dwindled. The first thing I like to do is ask students about these words. Do they know it? They can picture what it means. Can you, I can tell you about it so you can picture it too. Or I've not heard, I've heard it before, but I'm not sure what it means. I don't have a clear picture. Or finally, I've never heard it before. And typically when you first use this um, strategy with them and you use this um, format and you hand out these pieces of paper with the words with them, they all put a check mark under the I know it column because of course they know everything. And they don't want to admit they don't know something. And then when you call on them and you ask them to, you know, picture it and tell me about it, you'll see that they're having difficulties. So the other students at that time are now erasing all their check marks and they're um, putting everything into a different column. And yes, I love what somebody just said about the, um, the ELLs because I believe all of this stuff is appropriate for ELLs. And when I was getting my SEI endorsement, these were many of the things that I used in the lessons for the, um, from the students. So you'll see that they start to become um, more able to identify what they don't know and realizing that it's okay not to know something, but I'm ultimately going to know it because if you can identify that you don't know it and realize you are going to learn it, you are now in a growth mindset again, which is so important for these kids. And then another model I like to do is the Frayer model templates. And so um, on the right here, you see Jerry has done one for the word Basque. And I've done four links for you to four different templates you can use to um, develop um, the understanding of vocabulary words. I'm going to just move and you see he did the word Basque and he has um, his sentences here. I just love this cute little picture. So moving on here, I've taken the Freyer method and I've done those four vocabulary words for you. And I change it up a little bit for the language impaired kids. I do put the definition here, but instead of characteristics and attributes, I use a synonym because I found that was helpful. And under the sample sentences section, I used the, just as Beck says, use the sentence right from the text. And then below it, I would put another sample sentence um, for the student to see another way of understanding the word in another context. And then of course, I always had a, a picture with it. So I'm not gonna go into over all four of them, but I did reaping and anticipate is here for you and congregate as well as dwindle. And then um, another thing that we use at the day school is we used to use something called the vocabulary card. So you could use this in, in, a, in addition to or in versus the Freyer method. And that's where you break the word into syllables, which we helped our students if they had to tr trouble with um, decoding it. Again, there's the picture, the synonym, the antonym. You have the part of speech, you have the same friendly definition, and then you have the sentence from the text, and then you have another sentence for them. And I gave you, um, a sentence. Um, I gave you another um, blank one here so that you can use this yourself and um, as a blank and use that for going forward with any of your students. It's very helpful. Another element we wanted to talk about now, segueing onto a higher level, is talking about comprehension at the sentence and the discourse levels. I always realize that we have too much information for you people. I bet you're like exa exhausted listening to me go on and on. Um, but we still, we do have some people that have to jump off, but okay. we still have probably, I would, we've only almost the same, number. almost the same number. We probably okay. have people that add to this. That's great. So, so um, one strategy that I always used um, with reading and, and, and uh, with reading and, or versus anything when I was working was the visualizing and verbalizing strategy from um, Nancy Bell. I love it. Um, however, um, she, her structure words were just words, and I was working with the non-readers. So when I started this uh, program at the day school in 1997, I added these icons to it um, to make it um, user-friendly for the itty-bitties that I was working with. So when they saw the what card, they saw the character and the setting icons, so they knew what they needed to do. 
And um, these, so you can see that it's just some generic things from getting images online, as well as the um, using the icons from Mary Ellen's, um, I forgot what you call them, the icon PowerPoint, whatever they're called, Sheila. Yes. The, the uh, I, digital icons. Thank you, dear. Oh my gosh, having a word with you, a problem. Also, so, Linda, we noticed, or uh, I always noticed that kids wouldn't um, readily use this until it was related to the discourse story grammar marker then right. they would think oh i could this would be mood or this would be something that i remember from this other program so it it helps yeah. to integrate programs yeah and then i was getting frustrated because and so i i changed the order these are not in the order i put these two structure words up here because i wanted kids to concentrate in these four but i was still the kids that i were having that were coming in really couldn't get it so a few years ago i divided them up into cake what i call cake and ice cream so to me the cake is the biggest part of the cake you have that this is the um, whole basis of it if it wasn't a cake there would be no need for icing mm -hmm. so i taught the students that the first four things i want to know is the what the where the movement and the mood i don't care if it's pink i don't care if it's big i don't care about various those other things i don't care about the time of day that's not what i want to know first what i want to know first is what where movement and mood and so they learned the little itty bitties learned to tell me this just the cake first and when i wrote iep goals it was just for these cake items because i couldn't get the rest and then they learned that the other items were the icing on the cake these are the information that they could tell me afterwards and this made such a significant difference. And so I'm sharing this with you and hoping that it will help with the students that you're working with. When you're reading- I know you're, I know you're not keeping an eye on the chat, but um, people are loving, 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 loving. <laughs> people thought of using, a couple of people did say they had thought of using this with B&B, &B, but you're definitely preaching to the choir because they are loving. <laughs> That's um, good. This idea, I've got, we've got like so many great- Oh, good. So I don't want to interrupt you anymore, but keep going. But yeah, Linda, I want to- Mary Ellen had something. I just right. wanted to also say the cake itself is the basic unit, beginning unit of a narrative. Correct. I forgot that. That's and right. And it lends itself to going into the landscape of consciousness when you add the mood. So That's right. That's right. And it's, I just loved it. And they, it made so much sense to the kids. They really, they really, really understood that. And I forgot, I had a thought I was going to say here and I forgot. Oh, when I, when, when you're reading with somebody, you really need to check in for this cake and icing because when you start checking in and saying, so what does this make you see? Um, what are you visualizing for this? Um, it's amazing to me how clueless they are about what they're reading. And um, what I liked about the visualizing and verbalizing program is the non-comprehenders would just repeat back and I'd be like, well, yeah, that's a tape recording, but I wanna know your movie. And I think this helps them understand a little bit more um, what they, they need to do there. So moving to the next slide, um, I don't know how much, Mary Ellen, we wanna get into all of this stuff because it's already four o'clock. This yes. is from a pre, maybe we need to move, I don't know. Yeah. Mary Ellen did a beautiful job I, I will just um, briefly go through this. This yeah. is, uh, you'll get the, the slides yeah. anyway. Yes. But resilience yeah. is the overall theme. Of the theme, themes develop through the critical thinking triangle and how people reacted to things that happened to them. So there's all of these themes within Esperanza Rising, but the big deal is her resilience, her um, growth mindset um over time so perseverance and her her abuelita who gave her all the the advice so um we just put these here because i i kind of wanted to just show that yeah um so then this was one of the fact sheets linda that you found on the um mexican Re um, revolution what was it when did it occur um and those very things that we had on our map um, so the novel began with um, Aguas Calientes, Mexico. And um, so what does that mean? Aguas would mean water and Calientes is hot. And all around there are hot mineral springs, which makes it a wonderful area now. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, this is how it started and it was going to be the harvest in Esperanza Rising. So one of the things that I wanted to mention in this, and I did a little mini lesson on it that's on our, our um, website, mm -hmm. 
um, about the development of a kickoff. And you're going to see this uh, graphic organizer. If you fold it, Carol, okay, so it's bigger. All right. Okay, so this is um, if you fold this, it's in what manual? It becomes. It's in the um, uh, the autism collection. I'm making connections. Yes, making connections. It's in our making connections or manual. Critical thinking triangle in action. And also. the critical thinking triangle in action that I'm going to show. But I just wanted to, when I read this, I thought this is an example of a kickoff that develops gradually. And that's what happens in so many um, of our things that we read past picture books. There's not a dragon who comes in and does something and then everybody reacts. This happened. Uh, gradually, so all the components, when different things happened, could be recorded in here and they make the kickoff. The kids love this. Yeah. So I just thought I'd show that. And I'm going to share again because you've yeah. got it in your screen. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'm just going to go through this um, fast here. But, <laughs> but, but again, it, this is part of um, the ha handout. So if you're going to use yeah, it for a lesson, you're going to have access to this. So, but you, but people did want to see the demonstration of the um, critical thinking. Triangle yes. Action, okay. So. so we're going we to, go to get to that, to the critical yes. thinking triangle in action, yeah, but yeah. the major kickoff is her father's death and murder. And he was a landowner, very, um, had a very wonderful relationship with the people who worked for him and with him. So Linda, will you click that? I'm gonna go. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Can it move. Uh, oh, you can take remote no, control. No, I'll back. take remote control. Hold on. I don't think I have control anymore. Yeah, this is. Um, yeah, oh. you should have it. Yeah, there. Okay. okay. All right. Episode. All right. So anyway, I went through it, and I just thought, if when you go through something to prepare it for teaching. You have to be looking for elements of story grammar, elements of how the um, how it's set up, and sometimes that takes a little bit of time to do that. So, father is later than usual. The quote was, "He's just a little late." Mama bit the corner of her lip in worry. That's some body language. Have you ever seen somebody do that? Right, and there was a feeling because there had been the presence of bandits in Mexico who hated landowners. Um, so then there's a thought bubble on expository text on page 12. So that on page 12, um, there would be some information text on there about the, in 1930, the revolution had been, and it had been over 10 years there was still resentment against the large landowners. So that's some of the information text. Inside the house at this time, Esperanza's grandmother, who's the symbol of resilience for the book, um, she crochets a uh, hill and valley, mountains and valleys, and talks with um, Esperanza about how you may be in a valley, but sometimes you'll be again on the hill. On the hill. And then no rose without a thorn when uh, Esperanza uh, gets a little thorn in her finger, um, mentioning that. And then she always says to Esperanza, don't be afraid to start over and rip out the crocheting, but it really means to start over in your life, which had great um, influence. So anyway, the kickoff grows and I'm not going to go through it step by step, but I've put different things in body language, um, and things like that, the thought bubble. The kickoff intensifies. Somebody's coming, says Mama, and it's a wagon driven by their trusted workers, Miguel and Alfonso, carrying Papa's dead body. What happened? The mother fainted. Esperanza cried. Um, what do they realize now? That's a mental state. So they're all in shock. They realize this, and right now there's no plan. So these are the things that would build the kickoff. And this would be important for somebody who's in eighth grade to be able to do, sixth grade. Okay. So anyway, in the critical thinking triangle, this is how it's always pictured. And we have a great big one of these as well that you can use as a model 
um, in front of, uh, of all the kids if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this is the critical thinking triangle in action. And I just wanted to mention one thing about the manual. Remember those goals that we had that we took out of the um, article um, in topics and language disorders? Well, it's about developing those sentences with sentence complements. So there are sentence frames that will assist children in developing the sentence complement and in developing sentences that are related to connecting all the parts of the critical thinking triangle here that Linda mentioned before, how on the arrows, um, cohesive ties are written. So there's a little protocol for looking at it. There's a hat to wear um, if you have young enough kids. So anyway, um, that's the manual of the critical thinking triangle in action. And um, these are some of the critical thinking triangles. Um, like on, you're going with that, and if you've got a story grammar marker kit, you've got one of these. On the other side is a blank one. So um, this is what we filled in here. The father's murder, despair, and sadness. They know nothing will be the same. They still have their ranch and their trusted workers, but they really don't know where they're going to be going. So there's no plan really. Um, so these were all the things that were going on. Um, there was a dis disconnect between Papa's stepbrothers, Luis, and I forget the other guy's name, but they were um, very, they're very distressing people. Uh, and Mama felt uneasy in their presence, but they tried to come and take over. And those of you who know the book know how it developed after um, chapter one, which is the only one I was going to uh, look at. But um, in this one, Sheila, is the one that we put into yeah, the critical yeah, thinking so you, triangle in action. One. So I'm going to show you in the critical thinking triangle in action, there are um, bookmarks that are... Demonstration, yes, and you can show it in, I, in this one. Bigger. Yeah, so do the demo first. Okay, so that. this one, hold on, <laughs> do it, on, got the, so do it on the here. screen first, and then I'll stop okay. sharing so that you'll be bigger. All right, so okay, so here it is the critical thinking triangle in action. The kickoff now, this is another kickoff because, of course, in a novel, there are going to be an extensive number of kickoffs. Some are complete episodes, others are just little kickoffs along the way. We wanna look at the complete episode kickoffs. So mama is told that her husband left her and Esperanza the house um, and its contents and a yearly income from the grapes. But Luis says that Sixto, who was his stepbrother and Esperanza's father, left him the land and he offered to buy the whole place for 20 times less than it was worth and because women couldn't own land. And his next thing was to, I'm not going to get into it today, but to want to marry Esperanza's mother so that they could be a power couple. Anyway, this is um, the situation that Mama is um, confronted with. How did she feel about that? She was sad because of that kickoff. It almost left her powerless if she hadn't used her mind. So what did she know? Now this is where the, know, the mental state verbs and the feelings have some interplay within that critical thinking triangle. She knew it belonged to her and Esperanza and that the father wanted it that way. So she was disgusted um, when, the uncle, when the uncle wanted to get um, control of it by wanting to buy it. She was disgusted by them and she knew that they did bad things anyway, they were not notorious. She realized that it would be difficult for her as a woman to claim the property and that made her extremely angry. So she refused his offer. 
and those thoughts between the mental states and the feelings that interplay resulted in her refusing his offer. Now we could have put words like this, frust that she felt frustrated, that she felt worried in place of some of those other words. These are social emotions and they depend on the situation. So we have our basic emotions that, you know, Brady has all the little heads that show all these oh, happy, okay. sad, mad, scared, surprised, and disgusted. Oh, I thought you were. No, I'm not at okay. that yet. And then on the other side are the social emotions written in green that are these. They are a little bit more advanced because they depend on somebody pulling in a lot of the details about the kickoff. So with this little vignette here, I would put three feelings down and I would put three mental states down and I'd talk about them in the way we did. Okay. Yeah. So doing a lot of I do's before he's ready to do a you do. Exactly. So you, so you can show what it All really right. looks so like. So anyway, it really looks like this. And it's the critical thinking triangle in action. It's backwards here, but um, the critical thinking triangle in action. So those, um, you're going to notice that there are these little, um, we call them mats, M-A-T-S, mats. And with a small group, you can work on it like this, or you can write it separately and put it right on here. This is the kickoff, just the one we mentioned, how mama was told that the father left her the house, but uh, the uncle owned the land and he would buy it from her. These are the feelings and I put them right in here one at a time. How did she feel about that um, kickoff? And the kids put in the feeling, they choose them. But a lot of them I've noticed, they'll say, well, wait a minute, maybe we could pick another synonym. And the synonyms are, are there, she was discouraged maybe or pained or miserable about it. And they'll let, they'll make a case for why they wanted to put that in instead of that one. Um, and then it was, what does she know? So we put that right in there. She knew it belonged to Esperanza and that made her feel sad as well. She um, remembered from the past, remembering is huge to remember from the past that the uncles did bad things and they couldn't be disgusted. So, I mean, couldn't be trusted. So she was disgusted when they, when he made that offer. And then she realized that it would be difficult for a woman to claim the property. And what? She's very, very angry. So anyway, this is a demonstration of that. And I just want to say, um, because I know, I know that we are really down on time here, but I did, um, you, you will be able to have access to all of this stuff on Esperanza um, in your handout. There's multiple handouts, so don't worry about that. I was thinking, should we do it? No, we got to continue. And, and remember, it is being recorded. I'm sorry, but we have a lot of information. <laughs> we really did a lot of planning, Linda. I know, okay. I know. Um, so anyway, the cohesive ties are very, very important. And I just wanted to mention that, the cohesive tie jargon. And um, a lot of you have that, the cohesive tie that goes right on here and uh, can be attached with a clothespin with words like because. And you can demonstrate, but on the other side of because, there's the more advanced cohesive tie since. And furthermore, but where we have to laugh a little bit about it um, is however. So, so, therefore. So there's an opportunity to really delve into um, those cohesive tie words on those arrows. And that's mainly what this is. It makes a wonderful whole class activity if you go in to do it. And it's demonstrated in the, um, on our website and also uh, verbally in the, um, in the directions that are here.
Right. And so remember, we, when they're using whether the critical thinking triangle or the cohesive tie um, jargon, you want to think about that gradual release of responsibility. So with the critical thinking and triangle mat, you're going to do a lot of I do's and you're going to do a lot of we do's. And then when they get to a y'all do, you maybe divide them up and they do it with a partner. And then ultimately they're going to get the mat and they're going to do it by themselves. And in terms of documentation, somebody was asking about earlier, I would use that. And I would, after they were done doing their first pass at it as an I do, um, I would then Xerox that to show where they were at and talk about and document on how much scaffolding they needed. And you can see the progression for how, where they're getting initially and where they're getting um, finally on that. And the same thing for the ties. You're going to be wearing that tie and you're going to be saying this over and over again. And then um, they will um, ultimately do it independently. So these things mesh with each other, the tie and the Correct. critical thinking so triangle. So both of these things, I, I, and so working with the student, I would have that critical thinking and triangle mat out all the time, and I would have these cohesive tie words out. He may not want to be putting the tie on, but these words could be laid on the table. And as we're, you're developing cohesion, you could use one side of the word but, but then you would flip it over and say, this is great, but now you're also getting older, so I want you to practice using the other side of it. So I think it's really great for the student to understand how they're going to segue from more basic cohesion to more sophisticated sophisticated cohesion. So I would leave this, whoops, sorry, that was my door. I would leave this, this out all the time. Yeah. So now we did want to talk a little bit about, um, you know, text complexity and close oh, reading has been a buzzword in all the schools. And of course, our students have difficulty reading. They have difficulty understanding and listening to the text. Um, so what do we do with them with close reading? Um, so we have a, a manual that we wrote investigating text complexity and close reading from the point of view of a speech and language pathologist. We look at language a little bit differently from other people sometimes. So we're going to, and in it are these four um, is a progression of the first read, the second read, the third read, and the fourth read, because students are supposed to read the same passage for different purposes over time. And that's the concept. Um, so we'd be talking about, um, for instance, on the, fourth, on the fourth read, answer and make up text-based questions. All right, so the text-based question means it directly pertains to what was printed. So there's a resource online called the Close Look at Close Reading. And if you click on this link, it will bring you to this article by Beth Burke. And she has really great information in it um, on terms of text dependent questions. So she takes you through those four stages. But at the end of her article, she has these common core anchor standards for reading. And I love these because I really became introduced to them as I was getting my um, reading specialist um, license. And I always felt like I might be kind of going off the seat of my pants and thinking on questions or they weren't quite robust enough. So I love this chart. Your first pass of a passage is you're looking at key ideas and details. So these are three questions that types of questions you would ask. And under the green heading, those are examples of questions. So you, it's all done for you. you if you want to, you know, work on key ideas and details and concentrate on area one, there's some specific questions. So on the next slide. Excuse me, Linda, I just wanted to say, if you looked at all the bullets here, you'd see retell the story. What was the moral? Summarize the text. How yeah. does the character think or feel? So it's all the things we've been talking about, which is right. what you would be doing with your students. So I just took, just took a... I just took a question under each of those three first. I'm sorry comments. to interrupt again, Linda, um, but I'm, I'm getting a lot of people that do have to leave and want the links. So I'm just going to share my screen really quick um, with the link so people can take a picture of it. But a lot of people want to stay because they want to hear and they have time to stay. Okay. So I don't want to penalize the people that... Um, <laughs> I know. It, we're going to have to do a better job of reducing what we do. <laughs> I know. Well, well, you know what? Every one of the every one of these could yeah. be developed. I know. It's so funny. This could be like a course. You guys should, you guys yes, we need a part three. Somebody just said, "You're you're so right, Rachel," which is the name of my daughter, Rachel. Well, so we do need part three, Linda. <laughs> 
if everyone could just um, take a screenshot. Take a screenshot of this. This is your. This is the handouts and certificate of attendance are going to be at that link. Okay, and that the first link, and then the second link here is going to take you to our website, and on that on that page is going to show you all of the things that we just materials that Mary Ellen and Linda referenced during the session in case that there's something that you want to purchase for summer school or for next year um, using the 25% off discount which is at the bottom there SGM treat for treatment so SGM treat 25 25% off until uh, midnight United States Pacific time. So P I should have put PDT and I didn't, um, but it's midnight Pacific, uh, Pacific time. So I hope this gave you enough time. I'm gonna show this again when we're finished, but Linda's gonna go through the close reading and also going through the QRI inventory. So. Um, but you are also going to get credit for the full two hour um, session since it did go over. So I hope everyone had a chance um, to get that. Um, all right. So we'll go back okay. to this and okay. okay. So, so again, I just identified a question under each of those three categories. What are the key details? I mean, I, this is right from the chart. And then additionally, I think it's really important through this entire mm -hmm. book that you create a list map documenting Esperanza's mindset, both fixed and growth in each chapter, because she is very fixed at certain times and she demonstrates growth at some times. And I think it's a good example. So um, key details. Yep. So next slide. Yep. So these are just the maps that you would use to answer those questions. And then moving to the next slide, the next craft and structure would be what you would address through your second reading. So I chose a question under each of those headings. And on the next slide, um, and I just wanted to say in there, Linda, it even talks about, did the author use a text structure? Yeah, it's, it's so, yeah, it's you unbelievable, know, it's, these questions. Yeah. yeah, and it ties right into what Mary Ellen does. So I just picked the first one, explain what it means, there is no rose without thorns, see if you can divide it into parts, and who's narrati narrating the story. So again, the, uh, the first one really doesn't lend itself to a map, but the second two lend itself to a list map. And then the final one would be um, integration of knowledge and ideas and ca uh, section seven and section nine are for narratives. Question, uh, section eight is really for informational text, so it doesn't apply to this. But again, you look at all these questions and it, it, it ties right into what Mary Ellen has done, has created. So on the next slide. The tying into the illustrations that you provided about the Mexican uh, yeah, revolution. There's so much. Looking at the illustrations for what you get out of it. Yeah, it's amazing. So you can describe the setting in terms of time and place, and then they would be able to use, that's why those they were given those pictures to do that, and they would be able to answer those questions using those maps. And you know the compare contrast map is like that because um, the kids have trouble putting anything into a Venn diagram or things like that. So it's, yeah. a, it's a way to do that. Another thing that you can use another uh, when you're working with a student, this theme maker card could be out on the desk all the time or you could use the large map of it. And in this case, you want them to really understand when they're answering questions that they have to organize their information according to a particular text structure. And if you say compare and they start in their mind, they can visualize Mary Ellen's compare contrast map in their brain, they're going to organize better what they're saying or orally. If you say list and they visualize the list map, again, it's going to give them a structure in their brain to be able to organize their, their information. They need to know these words, compare, list, describe, and relate them to a text structure so that they can answer this information. And I would anticipate that somebody in the eighth grade should be doing those first two rows. I think problem solution, persuade, and argument are very difficult, and they're going to be needing to do some I do's and some we do's before mm -hmm. they would ever do that 
for a long time for homework. They'd be doing that in school with you. But those first, those first two rows, they should be able to handle. But they don't understand what they're doing when you say these words to them if you just say them orally. But this visual makes it much more easier for them to understand. And also, you know, our friend that we analyzed was emerging into um, stage three of a narrative, which is the causal chain, which is huge to get to cause effect. They have to realize that the effect of a cause might be a problem. And that's where you get into those higher level things. Yeah. So they aren't even thinking that way. No, they're not. So on the next slide, um, I just love this. Mary Ellen. Um, created this. And as we know, this student, he was at a level two. So he was at that reactive sequence, which is um, not the lowest depth of water, but it's the next in the second quadrant there. Mm -hmm. And I like that because we know that's where he is. So that's something that you can show to a teacher. Look at this chick that mm -hmm. you have in your class. This is where he's at. He's supposed to be at level four, the fourth quadrant. The questions you're asking him, what you're asking him to do in the classroom are in the fourth quadrant, but he's only in quadrant two. And if you look at the words on the dial, which I think are on the next, is that the next slide, Sheila? Uh, yes. The dial. Yep. Um, yeah. Well, this is yes. web's this, depth of knowledge. The depth of knowledge chart. This is the center part of the wheel. And I love this because he's, he's cool. at a level two. But in reality, do you really think this kid recognizes these depths of knowledge words in level one in terms of identify and tabulate and recognize. I don't think he knows those words. If we could spend this time teaching him those words, think of what we would unlock for him when he's presented with questions and activities to do in the classroom that begin with these keywords. So he's like Swiss cheese. He's at a level two, barely. I'm sure he doesn't know the level two words. I'm sure he's missing level one words and he's expected to be doing level four. So this really, if you as a therapist can gear your instruction to working on these keywords, it'd be so helpful. And now Mary Ellen. I was just gonna say a few people have commented to me in the question and answer and the chat, how they've got sixth graders and higher that are, that are absolutely at level one. Yes. yes. It's so yes. true. It's so and, true. And you, you know they are bombarded with the high-level questions. Analyze, oh, critique, let's critique this. You, it's just, it's very, very important to show this in collaboration with other educators. And the other side has Bloom's Taxonomy um, questions and words that go with Bloom's Taxonomy with the same. Um, so if you have a child who's at the very beginning here, the very shallow water, and you are trying to ask him these questions, it's going to be a mismatch. So there's a lot of progress to make. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, I, but she's making it so systematic and explicit for you that you can do this, you can do this. So taking that map at the beginning of the um, uh, PowerPoint presentation, I, here's the same map again, and I would use this in therapy with a student, summarize the information, bringing a lot of attention to the um, cohesive tie words that were on the uh, lower right hand corner. So orally you would be d working on discussing with this, and if I was first working on with, with a student, I would try to segue from a list map to get into this cause effect map. I think this map is difficult for kids and teachers to understand. So I would say list the causes, the causes of the Mexican Revolution, and I would present and have him summarize those first three things. There are several causes, several causes to the uh, Mexican Revolution exist. First, there was a disagreement, you know, and you would go right down the right hand side. And then you would go down to the key words and I'd pick as a result, and then I would list all those effects. I would do that. And then we might do a we do and I'd start over again. I'd say, okay, let's start over again. I'm going to start at the beginning of it. Now we've already done as a result. Is there another cohesive tie word, key word that we can use from that box? Because I've already used as a result. What else do you think might work? And hopefully somebody might come up with the word therefore. They might choose another one of those words from down in that box or they might use consequently. So you give them an opportunity to verbally be doing this. No writing. This is just yakking, yakking, yakking. If you don't start using the word consequently or saying therefore or saying as a result out loud and getting a handle on that, you're never going to write it. Mm -hmm. Mary Ellen, you were going to say I something? Al I also just wanted to mention on this, um, this is the um, 
uh, theme maker tool and on the bottom of this page of it, there is uh, the topic center starters um, to use and uh, take one word from the green box, one word from the blue box and put them together. Um, Cecilia Lund did a lot of work with that. And um, so it's like the key words, but it's creating a topic sentence and you notice that the topic sentence is on the bottom of this map, not at the top. Because unless the child understands it, there's no hope of a great topic sentence. Right. And Linda, we make this look kind of easy in a way, but we, we um, you know, over time you develop expertise. Yeah. Well, I said that learn, teaching children how to write was a very humbling experience for me, how difficult it is for them to do this. Yes. And besides, they'll tell you what if you've made a mistake or not. Yeah, that's right. So on the next slide, um, if you want them to write a summary, it's very important that you as a teacher do this I do and you put together a summary so you know where you're going. You can't have them write a good summary if you haven't in your mind have a model of what this should look like. So I just wrote a summary for you, for you to see here on based on that first map going in the order. And then um, if we go after that map here, this could be an activity. Whereas, and this is a, a also good for an L student in ELL, you would just um, put the cohesive tie words, they'd be, um, those keywords would be highlighted and you would start it off first, and then they would have to create a sentence out of the information from the first effect, mm -hmm. and then the second one, and then the third one, and they would complete this whole, they would go right down. And then another way to do this would be, once you've gotten them to fill, uh, can we go back to the ones with the blank, sure. Sheila, go back one slide, yeah, yeah. just this one. And then after you've had them fill in the blanks, you could give them this paragraph, and you could have the sentences filled out, and you could have the cohesive tie words not there, and they'd have to put those in, you can do it either way. After they can handle this, then I would go to the next slide and I would teach them the, to, to complete this map using going from cause effect, cause effect, cause effect. And so you can add those beads. So they could start learning some other cohes cohesion to tie this together. Um, the disagreement over the Diaz dictatorship caused political parties to be formed that believed Diaz should not see seek reelection. As a result of the disparity between the landowners and the peasants, the peasants began an uprising in 1910. Um, because the land and resources were sold to foreign investors, conflicts throughout Mexico existed for a decade. So you're teaching them how to do this in a different format. And I would do this as a group activity. And if a child came up with one cohesive tie, I would cross that off in the box and then get the next child to do another one using a cohesion. And remember, you're doing this orally, orally, orally before you would expect them to write it. Um, again, and this just shows you given a, it's a homework assignment, giving a complete graphic organizer and a paragraph composed with sentence stems, they'll fill in the blanks. So that was the sh sample I showed you to use as a homework assignment, expecting them to use this theme maker. Yes. And then um, this is another um, uh, strategy I feel is that really kids need to learn to annotate. And anytime you've ever read something that Mary Ellen has given you, there's all this little chicken scratching all over it. And you see on this page, she's got <laughs> mental states written down and she has all these check marks. And I just love this how, and this is the page, this was the section that talked about the goals from that article. So on the next page, um, I had developed a um, annotation symbols chart that the students used at the day school. So they'd put a check if they understand, they could draw a shoe if it was an important turning point. A detail could be a bead, a question mark for confusion, circling important words, I'm surprised, or this reminds me of making background connections. I think kids are so afraid to write on things, but we want them to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't know if we have time for progress monitoring. I, don't know if we should have that. I wonder if we should do that at part three. We would in part three. Since we did not have time to complete the progress monitoring portion of this webinar, we have left you with some amazing and incredible tools so far and lead you to look on our website at mindwingconcepts.com under webinars, What Can I Do Monday Morning? The Story Grammar Marker Treatment Process Using a Trickster Tale. Mary Ellen and Linda focus on Zomo the Rabbit and use that to talk about even furthering what you have learned in this webinar. Please join us and learn even more. Thank you so much for being with us. Enjoy.